good things happen, but you were explaining why now is the time to be to risk off or a little well, more I think, cautious. I why? think you want to be cautious, right? I mean, I think you look at the world and you say, what do we know? We know that you are at the end of a 10-year expansion, what, I would, what we would call a miraculous recovery from the low of 2008. You know you have a trade war with China with many possible outcomes, but very little degree of certainty. You have a tough situation in the Middle East. You have uncertainty about Brexit and I would say Italy. And so you want to be cautious. And I think, I think one of the theme is that you don't want to be always full on in terms of risk. And so right now we're cautious from a macro standpoint. What does that mean? Keep buying treasuries, the dollar? Thinking about the risk you have on, thinking about the downside, thinking about what you will need to do in terms of trading out of bad risk, thinking about the liquidity of your portfolio, thinking about what may go wrong, and thinking about scenarios where you want to be able to add on weaknesses in certain assets if the time comes. And I so, think you always want to benefit from market downturn and be able to add. So do you just shorten durations and, and focus I think in on particular of, asset classes? To some extent, yes. I think, I think we, we you know, have no strong view in terms of duration in the U.S. right now. But I think we have non-agency mortgages. I think we have mortgages that we like. I think we like some credit. I think we like U.K. banks. I think we have a broad portfolio of securities that we like and we think are you know, bulletproof for most environments. Do you think that Jay Powell can do as he promised, act as appropriate to sustain the expansion and keep it going in the United States? Yes, we do. There's a lot of things which are out of his control. And I think one of the complexity of the Fed's job is to deal with what is not an easy political situation where his reading is not better than any of us in terms of what may or may not happen in uh, the months to come and whether we get a resolution in 2019 or not to the situation with China. Manny, are you concerned at all about this recent um, tumult in the repo market? Is it something that you guys at PIMCO are aware of, watching closely and wondering about? We are very focused on it, as you would expect us to be, because we are the largest bond manager in the world, and so yes, we do. Yes, I would expect so. Uh, we I think am. it's a technical problem, and we think that you had a confluence of events with taxes happening early this week, and we think that the Fed is all over this. You do. I mean, they intervened for the third day today, but you think it's technical, not a sign of no. something beyond that. No, and it's different from 2008, and I think we shouldn't overread into technical situation what, you know, more than a technical problems. Do you think we could ever see negative interest rates in the U.S.? I would say very unlikely. It's, of course, possible. But the U.S. economy is not in recession. Our base case, as we were talking earlier, Sarah, is that the U.S. will slow down to 1%. But we don't foresee a recession. And accordingly, there's absolutely no reason why rates should be negative. I mean, there's not necessarily a recession in some countries where there are negative rates. Is that the main reason? Well, I think if you look at where you have negative rates, there's two reasons, right? One, that they have no growth for the better part of the past 10 years, and two, that the central bank has been buying every possible bonds they can. And if you think of the mission of the ECB, they, re, they really have reinsure the weaker credit. That's the way, as a European, I think of it. The ECB has basically got Germany to guarantee Italy and Spain. And, and the result is obviously this very strange situation that none of us have ever seen of $17 trillion of bonds with negative yield. How close is Europe to a recession, and do you foresee one in the near term? They are not far away, and obviously Germany, for example, is very exposed to the China and the export sector, and, you know, that's... Not that getting a lot tip. better. Yeah, that can tip, but uh, France has done better than expected, for example, which is surprising, and then, you know, the UK... Who knows what's going to happen with Brexit over the next two months? Do you think that Brexit could really cause a significant market disruption if it's a hard one? If there was a hard Brexit and the UK leaves slamming the door on October 31st, it would not be great for Europe. Send Europe into a recession, potentially? Potentially. It wouldn't take much, I would assume. It wouldn't take much. Would we feel it here in the U.S.? No, I think the U.S. I think the U.S. I mean, one of the things which the U.S. shows 
is the consumer, is 70% of the economy, and is incredibly strong. And for as long as we have the consumer driving the economy, I think we're in decent shape. Yeah, I mean, Mary Erdos was saying, you know, that they, they say all the flows into Chase. Consumers in good shape. She's not sheets, worried about the it. Sheets are in good shape. So, so is that something investors can bank on in the U.S.? As much as anyone can bank on anything, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. And we like housing, for example. I mean, my my partner Dan Iverson, who's our CIO, likes housing, and that's why we have so much non-agency mortgages because we do like U.S. housing. We think that it's in pretty good shape and that the market is clean and that. Uh, but it's a good place to be. But speaking of flows, how much are prices over here in the bond market being distorted as a result of the fact that there's 17 trillion of negative sovereign paper in the world? So I think one of the things when you run a big asset manager that you know is that large pools of money outside the U.S. look at the U.S. as a safe harbor from a yield standpoint. And I think that you can safely say that the 10-year and every long duration assets in the U.S. has been bought by European and Japanese investors for that reason. So does it keep the yield below 2%, for and example, despite keep, what might be decent economic and it, growth? And I think my, my partner, Mark Kissel, always says every time you see credit widen, people want to find income assets and they come and buy them. And in 2018, in the last quarter, where you had a real dip, you saw people coming out of the woodwork and trying to buy assets. It didn't really happen because it was a really quick bounce, but I think you see pools of money. Do, does it coming. explain the inversion of the yield curve, or is that a signal, as it always has been, that a recession is coming? Look, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, it's partly technical. And we don't think that the pricing of the 10 year and the inversion necessarily make a lot of sense at this stage. How do you see the interplay between stocks and bonds? Because, I mean, usually it's a good thing, it's stimulative to have these low bond yields, but in recent weeks we've seen equity investors get spooked by the low yields in the U.S. and, and what that may pretend. So how do you say that playing out? So from an asset allocation standpoint, we modestly underweight U.S. stocks. We, we think the main factor driving stocks are earnings, and we think earnings should be flattish this year. I think that we're often too fixated on the S&P 500, but if you look at the Russell 1000, you basically see that the Russell is down 12 or 14 percent from the high, and that there's a lot of companies not doing so great. You have a panel right now on technology. The one saving grace about the U.S. stock market, just to state the obvious, is that the Fang have done so well and have been so innovative in what they do and create shareholder value. But if you're the CEO of a manufacturing company, the environment is not great. And to be honest, you're not sure what to do about your capex. You don't right. know how much stock back back you, you should do. But that gets to this whole idea of business investment and the fact that it's slowing. And there is still concern that eventually that creeps into the consumer and the consumer-led economy, of course, that everybody that's, comes yeah, back to. And that's, and that's, and that's, the, uh, that's the tail scenario, that people lose confidence and that slowly the consumer gets affected by the environment and, 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 have, and have a slowdown in spending. But, but I would say the job market is so strong that that really is stimulated. One thing that, that, that came up during our panel was the election and how that might play into the current investment landscape. What are you guys at PIMCO anticipating and how do you think it'll shape markets? Well, ahead of, uh, of policy, Libby Cantrell is much more uh, apt to answer that question than me. But I think she would say, if she was sitting here, she would say, it's a lot we don't know. It's just too early to tell. And it's definitely not a good thing to invest based on what we know right now. We, so, met, we mentioned uh, this is your first TV appearance. In Sudan, that's right. I, but you've been running PIMCO now for three years. For three years. So just there was a lot of tumult early in your tenure. How do you think about the changes you've made and where PIMCO is right now in terms of an asset manager? It's, well, we're doing great. It's a team effort. So it's really not about me. It's about a group of people who want to go in the same direction, who want to deliver value for customer and who care about performance. And we do one thing, we do fixed income. We hope to do it better than most. 
but it's been a great ride and I'm incredibly proud to have been asked to run PIMCO. I think we have this great partnership with Dan Iverson and we're doing well. So it's, uh, it's good.